Thank you for you know taking time out of your um, is, is a busy week. Uh, you know the the uh, screening uh, at Grimfest is is coming up now next month. How you, how you are uh, how are you feeling about that? Um, I'm quite excited about um, um, the film being on Grimfest. So um, yeah, I haven't been to Grimfest before, um, but I've I've heard of it um, and. I know that they've got uh, a nice little um, uh, sort of fan group of people who goes to see horror films and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, who knows if they'll enjoy my film. Hopefully they will. I don't know if it's scary enough for them. Well, I mean, I think you know, Grimfest is, is kind of like the sort of like Fright Fest and things where it's, yes, the the name of the festival, you think, oh, ah, and, you know, dead bodies everywhere. But... It, it, it's uh, much more about cinema that is, you know, sort of embraces that dark heart in in some way. So I think that you know, Seagull is is a perfect a perfect film that would complement that. You know, yes, okay, there's not like a, a Michael Myers running around, but you know, there are some you know some pretty dark imagery and and ideas within it. So I'm sure it'd be fine. Yes, definitely some dark material. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for those that haven't had a chance to read up on it, uh, you know, in a nutshell, without too many spoilers, you know, what is uh, what Seagull about? Um, so it's about um, it's about a young woman who's sort of uh, who disappeared from her family, um, and sort of eight years later, she turns up again, and um, nobody were expecting. Her to turn up and back, and why did she go away in the first place? And those things are kind of you know slowly drip fed to the audience, and and so you start to put together. The pieces of the puzzle and by the end of it you well i think you get it at the end i mean where did the you know where did the idea originate um so i live uh, by the coast in folkestone where the film was shot and um we do have a few people who live down on the, on the seafront um sort of off grid and there was there was a guy called um Mungo, who lived there, um, he doesn't. He's passed away now, but he had uh, he had a little shack down there, and um, I was doing a lot of you know running and walking and stuff, and I would sort of pass his shack, and I think the idea of somebody living on the seafront, you know, off grid, intrigued me, and um, and I guess that was the beginning of the character. I, then I you know asking myself questions: Well, why would somebody live there? And then this story sort of developed about what had happened in the past, which had led the person to live there now. And then, then that led to kind of um, what then happens in the film. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you mentioned um, you know that you live in Folkestone. That's obviously you know where the film was shot. You know, what was it about the you know that location itself that sort of lent itself to this sort of story? So Folkestone has um, the scenery. Uh, the nature, the, the scenery around the area of Folkestone is very dramatic. We live next door to the White Cliff of Dover. And of course, just seeing that cliff from any angle is exciting and dramatic. Um, just going for walks along there, on top of the cliff, at the bottom of the cliff, wherever you see there's drama. And um, as a low budget filmmaker, you're always looking for, you know, ideas that can be executed without huge budgets. And um, this, the dramatic scenery kind of um, spoke to me and I, I wanted to do something that, where I was able to capture the scenery. Um, yeah, because I mean, it does, it does, it's almost, it's, you know, it's, it's almost its own character in a way, you know, it's sort of, you know, it, there's, there's these different, there's these different sides to it. Obviously, you've got the, you've got the family home, but then you have got the seafront and stuff. So it must have been quite nice as a, as a local getting to sort of highlight all these different areas of the place that you live in. 
Absolutely. It, it was wonderful. And, you know, I could, um, yeah, I, I love just jumping out on my bike and going and looking for locations and finding little, you know, secret bunkers in different places. And um, that sort of helped me visualize the film when we were in the writing process. I think I read somewhere that, you know, you, you, you didn't sort of, you didn't grow up in the area. It was somewhere that you sort of like happened upon. And then now, so many years later, you're still living there. You know, what can you remember what it was about the place when you first you know, turned up that you thought, yeah, this is, this is, this is for me. <laughs> well, um, I think um, my wife has always wanted to live by the seafront. Uh, she grew up near the sea. And um, so we were looking, we lived in London for a number of years. Um, and we were looking for a way out. So, um, you know, Folkston arrived and there's, there's a nice sort of a creative quarter down in Folkston. There's lots of stuff happening. Um, there's a high-speed rail link up to London, uh, the sea, you know, and, you know, property prices are affordable compared to uh, London. So um, it seemed like a, like a good option. I mean, I, I mean, for a certain a certain generation of, of Grimfesters, you know, they're gonna they're gonna see uh, you know, Jessica Hines in this film. You know, everyone knows from you know from a from a work in space and things. You know, how did how did she get involved? Because again, you know, first time feature, you know, low budget project. You know, she's you know she is someone with you know with a with a following and a, and a fanship. You know, how did she uh, come on board? Um, so um, Jessica is one of those people who, uh, if she's, I think she, she, she sees something interesting, reads something good, then uh, if she can, then she wants to be involved. Now, so um, I was lucky that Jessica uh, lives in Folkestone. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think she heard about the script when I was um, sort, of, sort of starting to um, uh, advertise for actors and, uh, you know, running uh, castings. And she got in touch and asked to see the script. And um, I think she read it and then she came back to me and said that she, she'd love to get involved. So we had a meeting and then, um, yeah, it, it, and then it, it, we were fortunate that Jessica wasn't too busy at that time when we were filming and it, it worked out that we could uh, fit it in or she could fit it in to, to her schedule. Um, yeah, I think also she quite enjoyed um, filming something locally where she could, you know, still go home for lunch and see her family and um, without being away for days and weeks. I mean, it's definitely, you know, this, uh, this interview is definitely making it sound like, you know, folks in the, uh, the place to be. So. Well, yes. I mean, I, I, I often say that, so uh, I lived in London for 15 years and I made lots of short films there. And um, it, it was quite difficult finding locations if you didn't have, um, you know, lots of money. Um, the, whenever you came to, you know, a cafe, a shop or location you wanted to shoot at and you'd find, you know, the owner or the manager, they would always say, well, how much can you pay? And then you <laughs> try and negotiate and you can get it for free. Um, in Folkestone, it, it, I had a very different experience. Whenever I came and knocked on people's doors and said, um, I'm looking for a place to film, then, you know, the people always say, well, how can I help you? Which is a very different um, uh, attitude to, their, to you know, the one you meet in, in London. So I think in Folkestone, it's a small community. The idea of having a film shot here with, people's shops and businesses in the background. That's exciting to people. And I think maybe in London, people are a bit more, um, they're used to this. So, you know, uh, it's not as exciting. Yeah. And one thing that sort of stood out um, when I was watching it, you know, is the film is, you know, it, it's, it's rich with secrets. You know, the family all have their own versions of the truth and are masking certain, certain aspects of, of themselves and their lives. I think this sort of this comes across um, on the screen with like, this really, really heavy energy. Um, it's like you know you can always feel the weight of the burden of, of everyone's secrets. You know how did um, how did you craft this through you know this this sort of energy through your you know your visual side, style and the editing? Um, well, so I, I think I mean from the writing, everything came from the main character, uh, you know, who lives off grid. And she obviously carries 
some secrets that hasn't been that is going to be revealed and so we also wanted to make sure that everybody else you know in the film had secrets so it became a theme um in i mean in terms of the, the sort of the heavy atmosphere i think that just um it it sort of arrived at some point during the editing um i think some of the scenes or if you you know reading the script there seemed to be more comedy uh in the dialogues um but then when it came to um to, to editing it um it just sort of it felt more real with sort of a, sort of a darker um atmosphere and so some of the comedy were you know cut out because suddenly it didn't it didn't feel like it was it was that fitting um so yeah it kind of it found itself really um i mean i've heard i've heard other filmmakers talking about how when they sit down to you know they write a film they shoot a film and then when they start editing a film then it's almost like the film has to find itself um i very much felt that because the the, the way it turned out was quite different to the way it was you know visualized in the beginning but i think that's often the case with with low budget film you have an idea and then on the day it doesn't quite work out you have to you know get get by with less shots and and less time and uh, and then the editing sort of the film has to sort of find its own fate i say i mean i think that you know what you've what you've ended up with definitely definitely works because i was sort of sat there you know, shifting uncomfortably at you know this just awful sort of you know there's a there's a, there's a dinner scene and it was just like it just felt like everything was sort of like weighing down on me as a as an audience mm -hmm. member so i definitely think that you know it sort of works to really sort of like hit home with with these you know ideas that you're exploring um but you're sort of so sort of moving on from that you know that the name seagull you know there seems to be a trend at the moment um for films being named after after animals you know why did you decide on the uh, on the name seagull um so it was always called seagull and i guess because um it is it is quite a grim story and if you live in Folkestone or any other seaside town you're used to seagulls and so what happens is that the seagulls like overnight <laughs> or next morning they'll go through all the bins and then you know you come out on the streets and there's rubbish everywhere before it gets collected up and so this it's almost like this seagulls are kind of this sort of um, um they're sort of this um a nuisance or is it this sort of this thing in seaside towns that creates a lot of rubbish and so that uh, it felt fitting to sort of use that um as as the title and then you know once we when we knew that then we started shooting lots of seagulls and see see if we could get images of seagulls sort of doing um you know going through bins and stuff but also I think if you look at the bird on its own I took lots of photos of the bird and um you know the face of a seagull is is quite sinister so right there it just felt like a perfect symbol of um of the story I see there's also a lot of the you know a lot of their sounds you know the noises in the in the sound design you know again was that was that something that was just picked up naturally given you know where you live or did you sort of you know go out again and record some more and sort of really um sort of we recorded lots of sounds so the sound designer recorded lots of uh, um sounds of seagulls and um also the composer used um sounds of seagulls kind of slowed down which sort of you know and lay it underneath the score. So even if when you're not realizing you're listening to seagulls, you are hearing some kind of bird sound. Um, yeah, so so yeah, there was a lot of playing around with that. And it was very conscious decisions, you know, about putting as many uh, sort of different sort of seagull sounds in there as possible. So you kind of, it's like when you live in a seaside town, you're used to this soundscape there's constant seagull sounds everywhere like you wake up at you know five in the morning you can hear them you know outside your house um so it's sort of it just felt like sort of this we wanted there to be a constant sound of of sort of seagull scape everywhere in in most of the scenes yeah it, i mean it drove my cat mad but that was uh <laughs> <laughs> it's just like 
I can hear it, but I can't. I can't see. Where is it? Yeah. Um, uh, an added bonus. It's uh, you know, you've got a whole new audience. You know, market it to uh, people with cats. Right, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think I'm right saying you know this was this film was completed. Uh, it was completed a, a little while ago, a couple of years back, I think. Um, yeah. So have you have you had the time to uh, start thinking? You know where you're going to go? Where you're going to go next? Um, I have been working on several projects. Um, so yeah, I've been sort of working on um, on a horror idea. Um, but the, at, the, at the moment, that's sort of, I'm just putting it on hold and having a little break. And then at the moment, I'm experimenting with um, improvisation. Um, this summer, I was running um, an improvisation group uh, with some actors. Um, it's, improvisation is not something I've done before. I've always just stuck to a script and sort of dialogues that was already pre-written. Um, but um, I'm quite excited about what improvisation can bring um so i wanted to test myself and see if it's if it's a process that works for me so that's so yeah i've been playing around with with those with that at the moment so um i haven't got a film that's just around the corner of being finished um i think it'll be a little while um everything's been slowed down for me because of the COVID and stuff but um yeah my my, my I'm, I'm itching to get uh to get onto um, um, a new project, um, so I've got a couple of things bubbling, but nothing, nothing definite yet. As I'm bringing it, bringing it back um, around to to Grimfest, um, people are obviously going to be deciding, you know, what they what they're going to watch at the festival. Why should they? Uh, why should they uh, take a chance on on Seagull? You know, what what does this film have to offer that maybe some of the other films there might not give them? Um, I think um, there's 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 some heart and soul in this film, and I think um, most people might um, be surprised to find themselves sort of uh, emotionally engaged with the characters. Um, it's less about um, uh, there's you know it's, it's not really about blood and gore. It's more about um, getting under the skin of these characters who are having, you know, difficult lives um, and then gets caught up in this very dark um, scenario. Um, and I think it's probably a film for people, if you like not getting told everything from the beginning, it's, it's uh, I mean, certainly this film doesn't really give anything away right from the beginning. You have to really invest some time before you get given more information so you can put together the puzzle. So I think if you enjoy that aspect of, of filmmaking, then um, I think you will enjoy that. I think you'll engage with the characters and, and you'll enjoy putting the puzzle together. Uh, but yeah, don't expect the big blood scenario splattering everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>